Welcome everybody to our event tonight. My name is Melanie Brooks and I am the audience coordinator at the Bangor Daily News. And tonight we're talking about all things bicycle with my guests from the Bicycle Coalition of Maine. I want to kick off this event by thanking our event partner, Harvard Pilgrim Healthcare, and our subscribers. Um, thanks to your support, we're able to bring these events to you and keep our journalists working on the local stories that you count on. And um, I'm very excited to um, welcome Jean and Jim here with us. Before I introduce them, I'm just going to point out that you may have noticed that you are all muted. And I'm going to ask you to keep yourself muted as we talk to Jean and Jim so that we can hear what they have to say. Jim has a wonderful slideshow presentation that he'll be sharing. Um, if you have questions, and I really hope that you do, um, you can go ahead and put them in the chat box. I just put a little welcome message in there. And as Jean and Jim are talking, if you think of questions, please drop them in there. And then when we're done with the slideshow, we, um, we can hop in and start taking your questions because I want this to be a fun interactive event. And if you get the chance to talk to two people from the Bicycle Coalition of Maine, I think you should take advantage of it. So, um, I'd like to take a minute to introduce both of them. Jean Sedaris joined the Bicycle Coalition of Maine as executive director in early 2020, bringing with her 20 years of experiment, experience as an environmental and civil engagement advocate. She has spent her career in nonprofits advocating for effective solutions to pressing issues, and she is really eager to shape a path to making biking and walking safer for all Mainers, no matter where you live. Uh, Jim Tassie is a nationally recognized bicycle and pedestrian safety educator and advocate. And he is currently the assistant director for the Bicycle Coalition of Maine and oversees the coalition's education and advocacy programs. And he is gonna share with us tonight um, some of his favorite trails to ride in Maine as the leaves are changing colors and it's getting a it was a beautiful day out today, but it's getting a little bit cool. You want to get outside. You want to experience Maine's beautiful foliage in a different way. Why not hop on a bike and take a ride? So without further ado, I have some questions. And Jean and Jim, feel free to hop in and answer them. Doesn't matter who goes first. Um, I'll start off with a question for Jean. So for those of us in the audience here who are intimately familiar with the Bicycle Coalition of Maine, can you please share a little bit of information about the organization, your mission, and what kind of work you guys do? Sure. Hi, everybody. I've seen also a lot of familiar faces and names, so this is so great. And thank you, Melanie, for having us on. Uh, so the Bicycle Coalition of Maine is a nonprofit and works to make Maine better for biking and for walking. We were founded in 1992 by a small group of dedicated cyclists and have since really grown into one of the most effective cyclists and pedestrian advocacy organizations in the country. We work statewide to really find ways to get more people out on their bikes and walking and to make that experience safer. So Jean joined the Bicycle Coalition of Maine right before the pandemic hit. Can you give us all a little sense about what it's been like to start a new job while you're in quarantine? Yeah, it's certainly been challenging and unexpected, I would say. Um, I did start just a few weeks, uh, maybe two, two, three weeks before everything really shut down. And, you know, then we had to make tough choices of canceling events. We had to cancel our bike swap that we hold every April. We have an annual bike main seven day ride in September. We had also planned lots of group rides and, and, you know, so many activities. So we had to cancel all of that, which was tough. But, you know, as I've been reflecting back on um, this summer, I think so many of us have been reminded of really what matters most during these times and, you know, the health and safety of our friends, our families, and our community. And how much the, the value of being able to get outside to walk or bike or other activities, it's just been so important, I think, for all of us, for our physical and our mental health. So I just feel really privileged to be at an organization that aims to make biking and walking safer and more accessible to more people. And I think we need that now more than ever. So that's really energizing and exciting. That's awesome. Way to turn something around that might have <laughs> been, you know, not what you really expected. Um, Jim, I'm hoping that you can tell us a little bit about 
the programs that you work on. I know that there are several um, safety and educational uh, campaigns that you have created and continue to work on. Can you tell us about those? Well, there's, uh, there, there are quite a few. Um, I oversee the education and advocacy work for the coalition and uh, really our bread and butter work is the education work. It's really uh, something we started early on in our, um, our career as the organization uh, first developed. Um, we have a contract with the Maine DOT and we provide bicycle and pedestrian safety education uh, in a normal year around the state to about 10,000 people. Um, this year, it's been a little bit different. We've been doing stuff more online. We're still getting materials out there. Some rodeos are starting to come online, but we do a lot of um, education work. Um, and uh, that includes off-road and on-road. So we, you know, we run educational rides. We run um, community events like rodeos. And we did a lot of work and uh, getting back to that work of going back and, and presenting in-person um, bicycle and pedestrian safety education, mostly to school kids, but sometimes to adult groups. On the advocacy front, um, well, you know, t today uh, I, I had I had a whole crew of BCM staff out. Uh, we were changing roadways for the better today. <laughs> we were painting uh, shared lane markings on a stretch of Route 115 in North Yarmouth, um, and that's part of our Imagine People Here program, which is, I think, um, one of the most satisfying and exciting things that we do, where we actually work with municipalities and try to um, experiment with uh, ways to calm traffic and improve conditions for people walking and biking for, you know, just low cost, but very professional looking, um, uh, you know, methods. Uh, so today we're actually using our shared lane marking stencil and helping the town of North Yarmouth uh, indicate that the uh, downtown area is a place where bikes are welcome. And um, we also help them with uh, um, a design that put down delineators and what we do is we try to create traffic calming installations uh, using um, kind of like gateways, uh, a delineator in the middle of the road and then two on the edges of the road that kind of creates a little visual friction for um, automobiles as they go through. Uh, this is a redo of a project we did last year which took a condition where only 30% of the drivers were doing the speed limit and after we put in the installation, we brought compliance up to 80%. So we're very excited at um, how effective these measures can be. Other things we do on the advocacy front, uh, you know, the community spokes program deserves a, a shout out and we have a few community spokes on this call. So thanks for joining us. Uh, and that is basically our, our, um, our grassroots um, volunteer advocate program where we, uh, we try to train people up in the basics of community planning um, give them a little information about infrastructure and, um, you know, have conversations about how to make communities more walkable and bikeable in the community. And it works a lot better with a local getting involved with those conversations than it does to have, you know, me or Jean showing up and saying, oh, you should make your community more walkable and bikeable. Um, you know, when someone in the community is really leading the charge for those conversations, they go a lot more effectively. Um, you know, in addition to that, you know, Gene will probably, we'll probably talk more about the Slow Me Down campaign, which is something, um, you know, we're both very uh, involved with and work on together. Um, you know, we do legislative work. Uh, so we've um, done something in the legislature every year since uh, 2013. And this year is no exception where we're going to be um, uh, revisiting some e-bike legislation to try and just make a little tweak to uh, um, make the law a little bit more friendly to um, the small businesses that are selling e-bikes, but um, there's just a, you know, a, a multitude of things that we're doing. Um, some of them fall into programs. Some of them are just opportunities that pop up that we take care of. Um, but it's, uh, it's interesting, exciting work every day, and um, I'm grateful to be able to do it. You had mentioned something um, in your answer about a, a bike rodeo. Can you explain what a bike rodeo is? Because I have no idea. Well, it's, 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 a, it's a bicycle traffic safety fair, but safety fair sounds so boring that we call them rodeos. Um, and, and what we do is we create what, uh, we basically kind of chalk out um, using an um, uh, athletic line striper. Um, we create a traffic course on a parking lot and then we put up signs at the intersections and we put you know dotted lines in the middle of the roads. And we tell the kids who participate, it's their first driver's ed class because they need to learn and follow the rules of the road in order to make the, the course kind of work. Um, and so, you know, Jean, Jean saw her first one this spring. They're, they're really fun, um, you know, and you get a certain number of kids into the course and 
you know, they, they, they're traffic, you know, they have to stop at stop signs, they have to make signals, they have to communicate with the other riders that are in the course. And so it's a, a great way for them to get some, you know, very practical education about what the rules of the road are, but they have a lot of fun doing it. And there's, you know, skills uh, exercises that we're doing as well um, so that they get just better handling uh, skills uh, with the bicycle. So that's what that's, a bike rodeo is. That does sound really fun. Um, We've done adult rodeos and I'd really like to bring those back. I think the adult rodeo is uh, maybe in the COVID era um, could be a real fun way to get people maybe together. Maybe you can make the stakes a little, maybe you can give away some ribbons or prizes or something. Yeah, make some, make, make the tasks a little harder. <laughs> um, so we talked, uh, Gene and Jim, we talked about this a little, a little bit before we jumped on, um, before everyone joined us, but um, it's no surprise for anyone who is trying to buy a bike, a boat, a fire pit this summer. <laughs> Um, they had some difficulty. My own family had difficulty. So can you tell me a little bit about what you heard from your contacts across the state on what sales looked like this year? What challenges did maybe smaller bike shops, independent bike shops in Maine face? Um, and who were all these people buying bicycles? Who are these riders? Um, fill us in. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, as certainly at the start of the, the COVID, there was a lot of uncertainty across the board, but there was uncertainty for bike shops too about whether or not they could stay open. You know, one of the essential businesses were all that could stay open. So one of the things we did sort of early on, like right when things hit was wrote to the governor on behalf of all Maine's bike shops to help them get officially designated as essential. And that sort of given they provide transportation sales and repairs, similar to regulations for car dealers and mechanic shops to remain open. So now shops were going from uncertain if they could open to just selling out their inventory. Um, you know, our staff have visited nearly every shop in the state across the summer and the story was prevalent from York County up to Aroostook. A lot of it was new riders buying their first bikes. Um, a lot of kids, like a lot of entry level kid bikes were really selling out fast. Commuters maybe looking to replace a car trip with a bike trip. Um, we even heard lots of stories of cyclists from out of state, like calling them up, trying to find out if they, if they had bikes available. But it definitely was a lot of that entry level kind of early bikes um, that were really selling the fastest. And, and shops had a lot of trouble keeping up with the demand, but also stock, like supply chains were interrupted with this pandemic too. So um, I think early in the spring, they just were selling everything and it slowed down a bit in the summer just because of, of inventory and supply chain, not because demand was dropping at all. Um, but yeah, I think a lot of people rediscovering the joy of biking, you know, in my neighborhood, I, I can look out the street pretty much any time of the day and see kids and families riding their bikes. And I know my neighbors, several of my neighbors taught their kids how to ride for the first time this summer. And then the kids are like, well, Mom, Dad, you got to ride with us too. So then they were learning how to ride or remembering how to ride. So there was, I think, a lot of family activity. It was something you could do with your family or alone. You know, when we were struggling to figure out how do we get outside and be around people, it was definitely activity that allowed for that. Um, so that was really exciting. And, you know, for the Bicycle Coalition, we want to help to make sure those new riders or rediscovered riders, um, you know, understand the rules of the road. They're safe out there. They know what they need to do. Cars are paying attention to make them safe too, and, and really making sure that enjoyment of cycling continues well past this pandemic, that there has been so much energy around it. Jim, I see you shaking your head throughout most of that. You're hearing the same? The same? <laughs> yeah, I was actually just uh, meeting with a, um, a shop owner yesterday, and you know, I asked him, how's, how's bike business? And he goes, it's great when I have bikes to sell. Um, so the, uh, the supply is still... Um, you know, a little bit of challenge for some of the shops. Uh, but I think, you know, in the long run, they're, they're pretty excited that they've seen this uptick in demand. And, and, you know, what we're trying to figure out at the coalition is how do we, um, how do we keep this wave going? How do we keep people, um, you know, maintaining that enthusiasm for uh, bicycling and, um, you know, make that translate beyond the COVID period? can imagine a lot of parents that were working from home with their kids who weren't at camp this summer, you know? You want them to go outside and do something. And bicycling is, a, is, a, is great. And like you said, it's 
it's safe, you've got distance. Um, so that's that's really exciting. But as I, I think about when you had said people were, were bicycling for commuting, did you see that during the pandemic there was less road traffic um, mm. with cars? And how does that, there might have been less road traffic, but were those drivers taking advantage of that as well? Like what does the safety look like over the summer with less cars on the road, maybe more bicycles? Sadly, uh, there, there were some upticks in um, crashes um, during the COVID period because there was some evidence that even though traffic volumes were lower, um, some of the drivers took that as an opportunity to drive faster. And I think uh, pedestrians actually um, saw um, worse outcomes than, than bicyclists. But I think a lot of those people who weren't driving were like, well, you know, what am I going to do between Zoom calls? And riding a bike seems like a great thing to do. So I do think that a lot of those people who weren't on the road um, are some of those, um, you know, folks who are rediscovering bikes that Gene was talking about. Sure. So I think that, um, you know, a lot of organizations and, and plans that businesses and organizations had this year really had to take a pivot. So I'm wondering for the Bicycle Coalition of Maine, how, how did the pandemic and how did the extra cyclists on the road, the lack of bicycles in store, how has this kind of changed your plans for the year? Are there things that you couldn't do that you wanted to do? And did this pause give you time to do things that might've been on the back burner? Yeah, it definitely was challenging. As I mentioned at the start, we had to, you know, cancel really all of our events that we had. And, um, you know, from the bike swap and the bike main, our seven day rides would be in our, our really signature world-class events and opportunities to get more bikes. It was really disappointing to have to lose those. Um, but it did give us a chance to, you know, sort of think back of like, what, what are we ready to go forward with? What do we think is really resonant right now? And as Jen mentioned, with the fewer cars on the road, but more cars speeding, um, it, it prompted us to really push forward an idea we'd had for a while, but the Slow Me, Slow Maine Down campaign, uh, you know, across the state for years, we've heard that the speeding tends to be the uh, biggest deterrent to more people getting on the road speeding cars. And so we launched this campaign to really um, address that issue and to think about how to get our streets safer. Um, you know, a lot of Mainers probably know somebody who's been injured or killed by while on bike or on foot, or maybe themselves have been, you know, in a crash. Parents are concerned about kids bike walking or biking to school or even just down the street or seniors trying to get to the grocery store or visit their neighbors. Like, these are all deterrents. And so, um, and statistics around speeding definitely um, uh, back this up, back this sort of experience that a lot of people have. So, um, we launched the Slow Me Down campaign, which is an anti-speeding game really aimed at uh, changing the behavior of drivers uh, so we can uh, slow them down and make our, our streets a little safer. We can talk a little bit more about that if you want, but um, I pass it over to Jim too to talk a little about the education stuff because I think that was definitely got um, interrupted in uh, during this COVID times. Yeah, it, it, it certainly did. Um you know, we, like I said, our bread and butter is going to schools and making bike safety presentations. And that obviously did not happen this spring. Um, it's only starting to happen a little bit in the fall. Uh, rodeos are coming back because it's an outdoor event that people are starting to feel a little bit more comfortable about getting together in outdoor context. But um, we wound up um, really trying to digitize and, um, you know, take some of the education materials and make them into um, videos that we could share. And so we did a lot of that. You know, when I was thinking of your commuter question, you know, we, we did a bike to work day video and everyone like, you know, showed themselves biking back to their, their home office. Um, so um, we had a little fun with that, but we, we have been creating a whole series of videos that have uh, all the points in our education program that are, um, available for parents to use, for kids to use, for, um, you know, teachers to refer kids to. And uh, we're going to continue, I think, to, to develop content in that vein and, and resources that are uh, always available, electronic. We created uh, one of our guys, uh, Eric De Silva, who actually lives in Orono, um, and who you'll have to get to know sometime. We, he's, uh, he's created a character, Bicycle Eric, who is a 
very compelling and interesting um, bicycle educator. His videos are great. They're fun, but they're super informative and engaging. We try to keep them short so people get a, a you know, a manageable bite. And, um, you know, that's where we're at right now with the education program. Uh, we're hoping the things return to normalcy uh, a little bit more next year, um, like we all do. I'll be sure to um, send everyone out links to those videos and a follow-up email um, too, so people can check them out. Um, I know in my community, now that school's in session, I see a lot of people riding bikes to school with their kids or their kids are riding to school with their friends. If a community wants to seize the need to create a safer bicycling community, how can they work with you to um, come up with ideas? Is that, is that your community spokes program? Um, we, we are the, um, the, the folks who run the state Safe Routes to School program, so it would probably be more under that. Uh, and that program uh, offers services that range from, um, you know, education about how to use the existing infrastructure in a way that's safe and compliant with the law, to, you know, identifying routes, to um, having, uh, or, you know, or even starting community conversations about what you can do to improve the infrastructure that connects the school to the neighborhoods. Um, so we do, you know, we do a lot of work in that vein and we hear from a lot of parents and a lot of groups that are like, you know, concerned about uh, the, the conditions near the schools and, and what can we do to get them better. We work very closely with the main DOT um, to try and uh, direct funding that improves the infrastructure um, that, that leads to schools. We like to get involved with um, school siting as much as we can and make sure that when a school campus is going in, it's not just being designed for school buses and minivans, it's actually being designed so the kids could walk or ride there as well. Um, so, yep, we're, we're partners in those conversations for sure. That's great. And um, I just had, I had one more question on my list before um, we, sh we take a look at um, Jim's slideshow. Um, the Bicycle Coalition of Maine was recently awarded an enterprise grant from the Maine Office of Tourism. So I would love to know what your plans are with this grant funding. Uh, can you share that for, with us, Jean? Yeah, um, yeah, we're really excited to, to um, have the Maine Office of Tourism award us this grant. So it's going to go to improve, um, we have a pretty popular where to ride route finder on our website. And this is actually the Office of Tourism provided the initial funding many years ago to create that. And um, we wanted to improve on it. So we're gonna be making some upgrades to it to add some more routes, um, to have it link easier to your smartphone apps to be able to do that. Um, it also has some really great layers on it. So as you're looking at a route, you can see where a bike shop or a restaurant or lodging might be along that route too. And so be able to connect that. Um, so we'll, that, I mean, the, the where to ride is already up and you can use it, but it's gonna be improved over the next month or so. And, and then we hope next year to really be able to add a lot more routes and some more details about, you know, um, what kind of route it is, how, you know, how hilly it might be or other things that people, how good the shoulders are or not, um, some other good information to be able to, to pick your route. Congratulations. Cool. Um, all right, Jim, do you want to go ahead and share your screen and um, we can take a look at your ride routes? So, um, what I was asked to create was a, a little deck of locations that are off-road and family friendly. So I have here cool off-road trails to ride in Maine with family. Uh, emphasis on multi-use paths with a little bit of single track just because I can't not talk about single track. Because um, at my heart, I am very much a mountain biker. Um, let's see here. So there are lots of opportunities in Maine. Uh, we are scratching the surface here completely in this conversation. Um, the red circles that you see, I'm gonna talk about uh, in a little detail. The blue circles, I'm gonna mention very quickly. And again, this is you know, just, uh, just a sampling of what's out there. Maine is a wonderful place to ride. Uh, we do live in a golden age of um, you know, bike trails and, and craft beer. So take advantage of those opportunities whenever you can. Um, I have to start out with uh, Acadia National Park Carriage Trails. You know, it's like 45 miles of trail. It is a wonderful place to ride. It's a lot of fun. Um, 
you'll notice the guy in this picture is on a mountain bike. You, you know, you can get away with riding a road bike, but the surface is unpaved. It's a little loose at points. Um, but it is, uh, it's a great place, very scenic to ride. And, and Acadia is, of course, one of uh, Maine's great treasures. Um, this is the uh, user map and all of the white trails that you see there are the carriage trails. And so you can see there's about 45 miles of trail. It's a little bit hilly in places. So, um, you know, if you're not riding a lot or you're going out with some kids who are, who are young, you know, keep that in mind. It's, it's not flat. Um, and there are places that are, uh, you know, legit, you know, they're short climbs, but they are, they are, they do have some pitch to them. Um, and again, this is just another beautiful vista. You know, uh, this, this is actually one of the segments that is paved going under that, that beautiful bridge. Um, you can learn more uh, simply by, you know, just Googling Acadia National Park carriage trails and uh, a site comes up very readily. Um, my understanding is that these do apply, like you're supposed to actually, you know, have a park um, permit to, to be riding, but you'll have to you'd have to, I didn't actually double check that. I remember the last time I was up there, I did buy a pass just because I want to support the park. Um, but I'm pretty sure you do need to buy a fee to go there. And someone here might have been there recently and knows uh, the answer to that completely. The next uh, location that I wanted to call attention to is the Eastern Trail, um, which is about a total of 29 miles each way. Um, this is a vista of actually the Scarborough Marsh segment, which is one of the most um, scenic sections of the Eastern Trail. Uh, this is just a, a beautiful place to go. Um, on this map, you can see that, uh, you know, the, the full length of the Eastern Trail is that the, the um, goal is to connect Kittery and South Portland. The green sections on this map are the sections that are done off-road, generally um, unpaved with small sections of pavement. You can, oh, looks like some of my uh, text didn't make it up. Oh, here it is on this one. This shows you the, the uh, detail of the specific areas that are more completed um, and are, are finished. They're off-road trails with a, uh, a stone dust surface. Um, the segments are starting from the bottom and moving up. You can ride from uh, Kennebunk all the way to Biddeford, um, ends in the hospital in Biddeford. Getting through Biddeford is possible, but it's, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a little bit more of an experienced rider ride. Um, so if you wanted to go down and do that southern section, I'd recommend, you know, Kennebunk to Biddeford and back is, uh, it's still a pretty good, um, I think it's about six miles round trip. Um, Saco to Scarborough um, is uh, the next section, and that is a continuous route that uh, goes just about to Thornton Academy and then extends um, uh, up into uh, Scarborough all the way to the um, intersection with Route 114 Black Point Road. Um, you can see on the map there's a little, well if you look at the, uh, the, the top section here, Scarborough to South Portland, um, you can see there's a gap in, in the green line here and um, that is actually uh, budgeted and planned to be completed sometime in the next two years. So that, that is underway um, and um, the, East, the Eastern Trail Alliance is, uh, is working to get that done as quickly as they can. We were very involved with the fundraising uh, to, to get the money uh, lined up to get that last section done. Um, and we are anxious to see that done. But when that section is done, you will be able to go all the way from Bug Light to Saco um, without being on a road at all. This is flat. It's railroad grade. It's perfect for little kids um, and, and people even just getting back on a bike. So it's a really, again, one of, the, uh, one of the great jewels of Maine. Here's some shots of family having a good time on it. And just a, a, another view. This is, I think, also near the Scarborough Marsh. The next area I wanted to call out was the Kennebec River Trail, which runs between Augusta and Gardner. Um, and this is a paved trail that is uh, primarily on railroad grade. There's like one or two little hills on it, but it's a beautiful scenic trail that runs uh, right along the um, uh, that's the Kennebec, <laughs> um, and uh, it is uh, just a good place to ride. Here's, uh, here's the map that shows the uh, length of it, so it extends from Augusta all the way down to, uh, to Gardner, um, and there are some short pieces in Gardner. There is, there is a conversation currently going on that would try to connect uh, this trail from Gardner all the way to the Androscoggin River Trail. Uh, which currently terminates in West Bath. Um, and uh, we are involved with a group that is actively trying to really get um, 
the state to kind of step up and support the development and completion of these rail trails, which are huge for transportation, huge for tourism, huge for health and, and recreation. So we're, uh, we're continuing to work on getting these finished up. Here's just another vista of the Kennebec River Trail. And you can see there, there is a, a track that still runs next to it that uh, I don't think it's ever used anymore. So um, going up north a little bit, the Carabasset Valley Narrow Gauge Railroad Trail is another great um, multi-use path, uh, a, a uh, gravel finished, stone dust finished trail that runs 6.6 .6 miles each way right along the Carabasset River. Beautifully scenic, um, you know, just a wonderful, wonderful place to ride a bike. Um, and here's that, whoops, sorry. Here's a, an image that shows the, the extent of it. You can see it kind of parallels Route 27, mostly on the other, uh, completely on the other side of the river. <clears throat> the thing that's interesting about this trail is that it serves as the spine to really one of the largest mountain bike networks in the state. Here's a, a vista of the, uh, <clears throat> of the trail itself. But this shows you what the kind of uh, off-road opportunities there are um, beyond the narrow gauge. And so the narrow gauge, I don't know if you can, can you guys see my cursor? Nod your head if you can, cool. So this area right here, this grassy loops area is a very family friendly, fun area to take people who um, don't have a lot of mountain bike experience. You could probably ride it on a hybrid, but uh, a mountain bike is preferred. But there are all kinds of little loops here that are beautifully scenic, flat, um, a little bit of texture, a little bit more difficult than the narrow gauge, but certainly um, worth exploring. And, uh, you know, Carabasset has really uh, leaned into um, trail development up there because they're seeing it as something that transformed that community from a, you know, winter only community to truly a four season community. Um, you can get the map that I'm showing here at the carabassetnemba.org uh, uh, site. So uh, this is one of the, the, the trail network here was really spearheaded by um, the New England Mountain Bike Association uh, um, local chapter in Maine up there. So some cool stuff up there. Here's a couple photos of life on the uh, Carabasset network. Here, this is a shot from Grassy Loops. You can see uh, my wife there having a, a big smile on her face, having a good time. And this is this is a this is a this is a, a slightly more advanced climb, um, but certainly uh, you know you can put the bikes down, you can walk up here. It, it, there is some bike trails up here. This is a mountain bike ride up here, but it's not a super hard one. Um, but it is a mountain bike ride, so it's a little bit steeper and uh, a little bit rougher than the uh, the narrow gauge. But the narrow gauge is a great place to go visit. Um, the next area I wanted to just give a shout out to is the Bethel region. Um, and uh, there's about five miles of trail right in the Bethel Village area, and then Mount Abrams got an additional five. There's a, there is a multi-use path in Bethel, and it is paved, and it is um, slated for um, expansion. They're going to extend it, uh, so there will be more there, and you'll probably be able to get, you know, a six-mile, six or seven-mile round trip off of that when it gets a little bit further along. This is the trail network that extends right in town. Um, this, uh, this stuff is great to ride. Double helix here, it's labeled blue as an intermediate. As mountain bike trails go, it is very smooth, uh, very user friendly and a lot of fun to ride. Um, we see kids out there all the time. I mean, I've seen people out there with tag-alongs um, pulling kids out there. So that gives you some sense of how smooth it is. It is a little twisty. It's got a couple little hills on it. So it's, it's a little bit more advanced than just like one of the rail trails there. As I said, there is a rail trail in Bethel. So you could start on that and then explore um, the, 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 the trails in the Bethel village. Um, you can learn more by visiting the mahusikpathways.org site. Um, Mahusik Pathways is just a fantastic group up there that has really been um, uh, leading the charge in developing off-road trails in the Bethel area. And, uh, we uh, we're very proud to report that their executive director, Gabe Perkins, is one of our community spokes and is just um, uh, generally doing great stuff in that community to support biking and walking. Uh, shout out as well to Mount Abram. I mean, I have to I have to kind of give props to Mount Abram because they have developed um, gravity. Uh, mountain biking, you know, you do need a mountain bike to ride here, but you don't need a fully suspended bike. Um, you can see from this trail, it's, it's pretty smooth and flowy. You can ride the chairlift up and just drop down on these. They have designed this to be very family friendly. They have kids programs on the, um, 
on every Friday. They have camps. Uh, this, this is an area where even if you have, you know, virtually no mountain bike skills, you could go here and have a good time riding the chairlift and riding some of the easier trails down. Uh, they do offer instruction, um, but uh, totally uh, worth a visit. I want to get the staff of uh, BCM up there for one of our outings. George's jungle here, as you can see, is nice and long. It's got just some nice flat um, sections on it. Super fun to ride. Uh, there is a climbing trail if you're uh, a little bit more skilled and want to uh, test your, um, your metal. Uh, uh, it's a good climb, but it's not a very long climb. Um, this uh, trail over here, um, uh, uh, Sneaky Pete's, is actually one that I personally um, designed and uh, was really kind of psyched to see the mountain decide to build it exactly as I had uh, laid it out, although they did um, do some stuff with the berms and so forth. Uh, you do have to pay here um, to, to ride, uh, even if you're climbing up and not using the chairlift. Um, uh, worth supporting. Uh, this is the first gravity, um, you know, trail served mountain bike area in Maine. Um, they're doing great. It's very exciting. And they are very, very about family. So maybe, if, you know, I, I, I put them last kind of in, 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 in order. This is probably, you know, one of the more adventurous things that you can do as a family um, as you explore off-road bicycling. Um, other places to consider, I mean, other multi-use paths, I want to just call out a couple. The Mountain Division Line, which is also in um, the Greater Portland area is a wonderful uh, trail that runs between um, uh, South Windham and Lake Sebago. Um, it is uh, paved for about seven miles and then there's um, off-road sections which are pretty flat, a little sandy, but, but nice. Um, there's another paved section up by Freiburg near the New Hampshire border. Uh, Orono to Old Town has a nice multi-use path. And you know, I'm, I'm really thinking of places you'd wanna take young kids who are just exploring cycling and um, it'd be a great place to go if you're up in the Bangor area. The Downey Sunrise Trail, I mean, I have to give a shout out too because um, it is the longest uh, uh, multi-use path in the state, but it is a bona fide multi-use path and ATVs are permitted on it. It is unpaved, it is only suitable for um, being ridden on a, a pretty fat, tired bicycle and you do sometimes just have to kind of contend with a little bit of dust from the ATVs. Uh, the last two on this list I have not been to, but I, I you know, I, I sent out some um, some emails asking for recommendations. The Aristic Valley Rail Trail is, it's another rail trail. It looks, uh, you know, sections of it at least are certainly unpaved. Um, I've never been on it, but, uh, I, you know, I, I was just looking at stuff in Presque Isle because Presque Isle has a small paved section. Uh, and then I saw this whole Aristic Valley Rail Trail. So if you're getting up into the county, it's worth it, uh, an exploration. Um, the VZ Rail Trail is another one in the Bangor area, and it's right near the uh, the Bangor Community Forest. And so this is uh, this is one of the trails that um, uh, it's a, it's a rail trail that runs through the center again of a of a bigger network of mountain bike trails. But there's plenty of stuff to be done um, right in the Bangor and Orono areas. Um, if you're looking to get more information about where to ride, you know, um, as Jean mentioned, our where to ride resource is a good place to uh, check out what you know places that we curate and recommend and we are going to be um, upgrading that site for better functionality and um, you know easier use. Um, uh, Main Trail Finder is another resource that's very main focused it's Community GIS is the organization behind it and um, they uh, they've got a nice resource that enables you to really you know find a lot of trails just by region and by type of trail that you're looking for it's hiking and biking but they do have the bike stuff for um, off-road stuff, um, Trail Forks is uh, the go-to platform for me. Um, they are just pretty exhaustive in terms of what they um, have on the database for places to ride in Maine and indeed internationally around the world. It's not always um, complete, but um, it's certainly a place to begin if you're going to an area and you're looking stuff. And they do include uh, rail trails. You'll see them as green trails. So I know that uh, you know, those, those are definitely considered part of the Trail Forks, um, uh, you know, selection of trails to highlight. And uh, the Rails to Trails uh, Trail Links uh, is another um, good site which focuses on rail trails, which you might expect from Rails to Trail, but if, if that's really what you like to ride, and those are indeed great places to go with families, um, with kids, and if um, people are just kind of getting back into cycling, rail trails are wonderful because you know, they're flat, they're straight, they don't, they don't ask a lot of you and you don't have to deal with traffic. So um, 
that's another resource to find that stuff. Uh, Eric, um, who I mentioned earlier, wanted to really make sure that if I was going to talk about this, I would throw out a few reminders, um, especially if you're riding with kids. But, you know, most of this stuff applies to anyone riding. Um, you want to think about weather. You know, uh, Maine weather is unpredictable sometimes. And, uh, you know, particularly this time of year, it's good to throw an extra layer into a pack and make sure that you, um, you know, you've, you've got what you need if the weather turns on you. So having a shell is great. Um, and even another warm layer if uh, the temperature drops on you. Think about dur difficulty and duration. Uh, leave them wanting more, you know, a shorter, easier ride can really kind of create a very positive experience that you can build on. You don't want to demoralize people and um, that is possible to do. So take it easy on folks, keep it short, keep it simple, keep it easy. And, you know, I've learned this with adults as well. If, you know, if people haven't been on a bike for a while, I, I ran a, a, an event called Get Back on a Bike a few years ago. And we did like a, like a three and a half mile ride on the Eastern Prom and that was enough. That was a lot. So, you know, it's really easy, I think, to overestimate how much people can do. You know, again, keep it short, keep it easy, leave them wanting more. You can always add another piece on, but don't bite off too much. Keep it small, especially with the children, because you want them to be um, digging it and coming back for more. Bring food, bring water. Um, Eric says, Eric, I have to say this because it was so funny in the email he sent, Eric has been known to carry along a camp stove so that in the middle of the ride with his kids, he can stop and whip up a batch of macaroni and cheese. So you can take that as far as you want. Um, that's my slide deck. Uh, so I'll turn it back over to you now. I, I've noticed over the past, I don't know, maybe five years or so, that places like Carabasset Valley and Bethel and even um, up in the Katahdin region are, are looking for ways to not just be a winter destination. And what has come out of that are these bicycle trails. How, have they found success in building out more of a four season recreation destination this way? Yes. <laughs> um, not, you know, you know, some ski areas are embracing it more than others. Sugarloaf is now getting more and more um, engaged with build out a mountain bike trail. Certainly, you know, um, there are communities around the state that are, are building mountain bike trails and then maintaining them in the winter for fat bikes, which are those tire, you know, the bicycles that have like a, a four to five inch tire. And that is another whole um, revenue generated for the winter. So bicycling is increasingly a, um, a, a four season sport and uh, communities are doing what they can to, um, you know, tap into some of that, uh, some of that business for sure. I'm glad you mentioned what fat bikes were. I wasn't sure if everyone on here would know what a fat bike was. It's the bike with those really big tires um, that are great in the snow. And there are some places if you don't have a fat bike or you want to try one that you can rent one at the trail, trailhead. And that's true in Bethel. It is true in Bethel. Um, so we have some great questions from the audience that I'm just going to dive into. Um, I'm really glad that you mentioned the um, Sunrise Trail because we have some Sunrise Trail fans on here. Um, we have a question from Joel on dirt trails when you want to see your partner who is behind you. Which non-handlebar mirrors do you recommend? Like maybe something that goes on your helmet or someplace else. Do you have a suggestion? Well, you know, if you're talking about like a rail trail as a dirt trail, something that's pretty straight and smooth, um, I kind of, you know, I, I, I don't mind the, uh, the, the mirrors that mount on your helmet, although I've never had great success in keeping them on my helmet. Um, I usually break them off in no time. But um, I, I think that that creates a, a very stable, um, you know, uh, frame that you can look into and see what's behind you. Um, I don't have a, a lot of experience with, um, with the wrist mounted stuff. Um, you know, for the most part on when, if I'm mountain biking with people, I'm, I'm turning my head around looking at them or not worrying about what's going on back there. We have a saying on trails. Um, we say, don't space out when you should be spacing out. Get it? Get it. Memorable. Uh, we had another great question from Wyatt who, um, who wants to, wants your input on why you think that some cities and towns are slow at adopting bike lanes. And he's specifically referencing Bangor. He says his wife and I try to bike around Bangor, but the lack of infrastructure makes it scary with drivers going too fast and passing too close. Um, and maybe 
again, a lot of the roads around here may not have bike, a bike lane. Um, so since you work with communities, what, what have you, do you have any, an answer for Wyatt or some insight that you can share? Um, sure. I mean, for, first I'll say, you know, Bangor is um, moving more rapidly forward than he knows. And, and we've been involved with a lot of conversations up there with the city engineer and um, one of our board members, Kiri Piccaccinini, is up there um, uh, spearheading Bangor Walk and Roll. Wyatt, if you don't know about them, you should get involved with them. Um, you know, and we are, you know, Kiri and I and, and Walk and Roll and John have been, you know, looking at places where bike lanes might be feasible in uh, Bangor. I will say that we are going to be um, helping to design a parking buffered bike lane on State Street, uh, Route 2 in Bangor, and we hope to maybe experiment with that um, next spring. But, um, you know, in general, I think that it, it's difficult to get communities to invest in bike infrastructure because, you know, there's a perception that there's not that many bikes out there that, it, that and there's also just this whole perception that you know cars are how we've always done it and so the idea of repurposing um pavement to give it to you know persons on bicycles is still an idea that is you know gradually catching on in Maine. but we've got some we've got some uh distance still to cover but you know things are getting better and um you know, we're involved with communities all over the state who are having conversations with us about, you know, what can we do to make things better? And, and um, Bangor is, um, Bangor, I think, is, is going to pop soon. I think it's, I think it's, you're going to start seeing uh, some, some big changes in the next couple of years. And I would just add, um, you know, this, that type of change, our roads were not designed for, for bikes or other people. So it's a lot of undoing and convincing towns and cities it's worth it. Um, and that's why we need like a lot of people involved because this stuff takes time. It can be frustrating. <laughs> um, but, you know, we've, this is what, you know, BCM's here for. And so like our community spokes are really trying to give them the resources and the, uh, the support to make it happen. But it's, um, it requires a lot of people saying that we, we want this, we'll use it. And, you know, I think I found like once stuff goes in, like all, especially these multi-use trails, once they're there, boy, they get used, right? And um, people start to see the demand for it, but getting it in is the, is the, is the, is the hurdle. Um, but oh, anyway, hopeful folks will get involved and you know, we'll, we can be a resource for you um, for materials or for actual um, like the community spokes or other kind of trainings and stuff. Yeah, some of those rail trails around Maine are just beautiful. Even if you don't like bicycling, just go for a walk. Yeah. Um, they're just, they're lovely. And they're, you're right, they're really easy. You can park at the trailhead and hop right on. So I think that we're really lucky to have those um, in our state for multi-use. Uh, David um, had a question about e-bikes. I am not sure what an e-bike is, but I'm hoping that you can fill us in. Jean, do you want to answer that one? Or do you, you can take that one, Jim. You are the <laughs> e-bike expert. So I'm getting I, there. I, I wanted to quiz you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so e-bikes are, are, are um, what is more formally known as a low speed electric assist bicycle. And what this is, it's a bicycle equipped with um, uh, a, you know, a modest electric motor. Uh, in most, most manufacturers are making bikes that um, only go up to 250 watts of power. Uh, they provide a little bit of boost when you're riding um, and, and they give you power in proportion to how hard you pedal the bicycle. Um, there are three types of e-bikes, class one, class two can only go 20 miles per hour. The class two, the only difference is it's got a throttle too, and, and those are actually not permitted um, in more places. So like Acadia, you can use a class one e-bike, you can't use a class two e-bike. Class three e-bikes are pretty much strictly on-road infrastructure um, uh, devices. They can, they're legal on bike lanes and legal in uh, roadways, but they go up to 28 miles per hour and um, they, they pack a lot of oomph. But, you know, I, I've got an e-bike of my own and the e-bike is, it's, it's doesn't replace your bike, it replaces your car. Um, what you find is that, you know, well, I've got to do like a, you know, a five mile trip or a three mile errand and I could take the car, but I could take the e-bike, um, you know, so I was a lot and you can show up and you're not perspiring, you know, you look, you, you know, you're still <laughs> presentable. Um, I've got a, um, 
a trailer that I can pull behind my e-bike. And so I, it turns into a real cargo carrier. Um, they are, uh, they're coming They're They're, they're already here, but I think, uh, more and more riders are going to realize that uh, e-bikes are another um, great device to own. Um, they, they, they are bicycles. Um, they feel like bikes. They ride like bikes. Um, we've got a, we've got a couple of bikes at the, uh, at the office right now. Um, and um, with some notice, we can even arrange demos on those things. Um, and once you get on, when you realize they are bikes and you get off them with a big smile. Yeah, I've had a chance to try out some of these recently and they are really great. And I think one of the things, you know, all that Jim said with them being like transportation, but they're also for people who might not be able to ride as long as they used to or want to, um, or ride with a partner that's much faster than you. Like, Absolutely. I think it also opens up cycling to a larger group of people who might not be able to do it otherwise or do it the level they, they want or could have, could have done in the past. So there's a lot of opportunity there and they are really fun <laughs> well and you know gene that's exactly what i heard when i was talking to uh, the, the shop owner yesterday it's like you know his big point was like you know people who've had an injury people who are getting older and they can't ride at the same speed that they used to ride but they're you know they've got younger friends who are still hammering along and they want to be able to ride with those folks um the e-bike is just a way to kind of like equalize the playing field a little bit and keep you in the sport longer um, you know, they're used on, um, you know, there's e-road bikes, there's e-mountain bikes, there's e-commuter bikes, there's e-fat bikes. I mean, every type of bike that currently exists has an electric assist version of it. And um, they're all fun and they're worth checking out um, because they, you know, they, they, they keep you in the sport longer and they can really, uh, um, you know, help you transition to a lifestyle that's a little bit, you know, lighter on the car. I'm gonna have to check those out. Those do sound like fun, actually. We'll hook you up. Come on down. We'll put you on one and take yeah. you on a ride. How many different bikes do you have, Jim? Just wondering. I have 14 bikes in my barn, but that includes my wife. Okay, so I got- Oh, I have, hers too. Yeah, so we've each got about seven. And, but really all her bikes are kind of versions of my bike. Yeah, you'd have to have a barn to hold all those. <laughs> I had a former colleague who said, um, the number of bikes you need is N plus one, where N is your current number of bikes. <laughs> There's always well, another one for a different kind of ride, a different trail. <laughs> so yeah, I, get, you know, I have a commuter bike, I have a road bike. My road bike is also my gravel grinder because I got two wheel sets for it. I have a mountain bike, I have a fat bike, I have an e-bike, I have a folding um, you know, small bike, and then I've, I, I kind of have a, a, a soft spot in my heart for old vintage cruiser bikes, so I have a, a couple of those too. One's at the <laughs> office actually up on the wall that's wonderful it's a good they're, collection to have um, we're devices. we're winding down we're getting near the end of our event and i wanted to um offer the audience the opportunity to um, unmute themselves and share a question or maybe share a trail that wasn't mentioned that they really enjoy does anyone have anything they want to share feel free to hop in joel did you unmute yourself to, sh to share something sure uh, first, I want to thank you and the Bangor Daily for uh, organizing this. It was just great. And um, Jim, I really appreciate the links that you gave for the different uh, trails that we can go to. Really appreciate that. Anyone else? Last call? Another set of trails that you may want to try are the Penobscot River Trails up in Grindstone. So Jim, I don't know if you've been up there to see those yet, but fine crushed gravel, um, views of the East Branch of the Penobscot River, um, a little bit of hills, but nothing that's not unmanageable. So that's definitely worth one to one worth checking out. I'll, I'll have to get it on the list. Michelle, I'll bet those will be really pretty in another week or two with the foliage um, up north. Yeah. Um, and if you know, you can check out the main foliage report too, if you're thinking about heading out on a trail and you want to plan around the beautiful leaves. Um, you can check that out. I know in the mountains and in the north, the leaves change a little bit faster. So um, be sure to check those out. Well, it is the end of our hour. And thank you so much, Jean and Jim, for sharing your experience, your expertise. Um, 
I can't thank you enough for joining us tonight and just talking about bicycling, all sorts of facets of bicycling. And um, thank you everyone for coming and joining us tonight. It was lovely having you here. Uh, thank you to our subscribers and to Harvard Pilgrim Healthcare that helped keep these events free and open to the public. So again, be looking for that email that I'll send you tomorrow with the recording of this to share with family and friends and those awesome links. And feel free to go to the uh, Bicycle Coalition of Maine's website and poke around and see what their uh, trail system has for you. Um, on that note, I hope you all have a great evening. And it was, uh, it was nice to have you, Jean and Jim. Thank you. Thank you, Melanie. Thank you. Thanks all. Have a great night, everybody.